Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, and welcome back. Welcome back to the Porsche Cool Podcast. It's Tuesday. It's owner's stories. I uh, have another Australian coming in today. We have, uh, we have a good one for you. Uh, we're up to number 38, and uh, I have Stephen joining me very, very shortly. Uh, as you know, all the owner's stories are done via Zoom. I'm in London at the moment. I'm not in Bahrain, uh, and we're doing them via Zoom. Um, so apologies for any uh, any issues with the audio or any problems with the audio. Um, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Most of the times it's okay. Um, if you want to be on these owner stories, uh, you just need to reach out to me on uh, Porsche Cooled on Instagram. Uh, just send me a DM on Porsche Cooled or you can send it to me on michael.bath as well. Uh, on Instagram and just tell me about the car you have and then I'll get back to you and we can schedule an episode in the coming weeks. Um, I record these a couple of weeks in advance now, not that far in advance actually. Um, So if you contact me, it won't take me that long to get back to you. Uh, In saying that, I have a bit of a backlog, but I'm getting through it. I'm getting through it. Anyway, I'm looking forward to this one. I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to get Stephen through Zoom from Australia and we're going to talk about his uh, Porsche Cooled owner's story. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. Like I said, owner's stories today. Uh, and today I'm joined uh, by Stephen, and Stephen's coming in from Sydney. Stephen, correct? That's right. How are you? Yeah, very good. Good morning. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Michael, for having me. It's just it's good to finally join. Yeah, I'm glad I've got you on. I always say to these people, the hardest part of doing the podcast is actually scheduling and working out the time differences. Uh, sometimes I make errors in the times, but today I've worked it out. So it's evening in, in Sydney and it's uh, morning here in London. So Stephen, I'll just let the listeners know, Stephen. So the best way to, like I said, the best way to reach out to me for these owner stories is contact me through Instagram and follow Porsche Good on Instagram. Uh, that's how Stephen got a hold of me. And then I'll just get back to you and we'll schedule a time. That's how it all works. Very easy, just a casual uh, Porsche chat. So, Stephen, well, let's just get straight into it. Um, you know, I always like to start these podcasts with where it all started, where it all began, you know, for you. Um, so, have you always been a car guy? Like, have Porsches always been in your sort of vision? Have they been part of your life since you were a kid? Did you start notice, noticing them when you were younger in, younger in life or was it later on? How did, it all, how did this Porsche passion all begin for you? Uh, for me, I've always been a car guy. Uh, I... Grew up on an island in the Pacific. There wasn't much in the way of cars. You know, 100, 100 miles of road on the whole island. It was only five miles by three. But the interesting thing was that there was, it was tax and duty free. So all of the owners there that had a little bit of money were always or importing these amazing cars from across from Australia or directly from Japan. So in the early 70s, I was seeing some sort of uh, very traditional Australian muscle cars like GTR XU1s and things like that driving around on these very, very tiny, often dirt roads. And it was just crazy to see these people driving these cars. And over there you could get your licence at 15. So when I was like 10, we had, you know, the old the old basher out the back, we had a motorbike. So I was always tinkering with something or or such. And um, I was very fortunate to be able to um, do that as a, as a youth and then, my family didn't really get into cars. Whilst my dad was was uh, mechanical minded, as was I, we really didn't start anything until I probably uh, got to about seventeen, and I was doing my apprenticeship out at Qantas. And near the apprenticeship area at the base, there was the training facility for the pilots and all of the emergency evacuation equipment. Okay. So what was really interesting was that all of the pilots at that time in the sort of late 70s, early 80s would be parking their cars in the street outside of the simulators and we'd be going in there doing quite a bit of the the maintenance in there. So there was everything from, you know, the two I remember remember distinctly was a 308 GDS um, Ferrari and a 930 Turbo. Um, nice. Both parked out in the street, often there, and to me it was uh, love at first sight, sort of poster on the wall type cars. Thinking, would I ever have the the dream fulfilled of actually owning or driving a vehicle like that? And you know, when you're 17, and you're sort of you know got very little to spend on cars, or at that time it was never going to happen. But um, for me, that was always, that was the chase, that was the dream. I was always tinkering, playing with something, you know, I had some performance cars and bikes at different times in that life. But then I fell into a void. I, um, I moved from engineering into a sales role and I had 15 years of 
company sales rep vehicles, white okay. Commodore station wagons, some of the most boring cars on the road. Yeah. And that was pretty much my driving future for about 15 years of not really enjoying so, so all the listeners, yeah, so all the listeners in the UK and the US and Europe understand, you know, these are, these are, you know, family cars, aren't they? They're, you know, fleet cars. When you're a salesman, they're kind of fleet cars. They're, they're just, I don't know what the, the comparative car is in the UK. Probably like, like probably Monday UK or Vauxhall or something yeah. like that. It's, you know, literally one step down from a transit. You know, it's a white station wagon, so you can carry all of the all the goods in the back that you're selling and travel around the countryside. So you, you see these, you know, you see a Ferrari, you see a turbo. I mean, I remember seeing, you know, um, you know, when I lived in a country, a coastal town, I guess, in Australia, which I've mentioned many times before, I used to see all these cars driving past on the highway, the Pacific Highway, when it used to go through the town and the people driving back to Sydney. And that's when I used to see all the, the great cars because the town I lived in, there was, there was only Fords and Holdens. There was just the basic sort of cars. So it's kind of inspiration, but you look at these cars, like you said, you know, you look at the turbo and you look at the Ferrari and you think, how am I ever going to achieve that? You know, as a kid, it's like, it's almost like, how do I get that? You know what I mean? It's, it's not easy. So when you start driving and you start buying your own cars, what's the, what's the first memorable car that you, that you got into? Uh, first memorable car for me was an RX4 Coupe. I was able to Picked that up. I was probably 19 years old and it was a little bit rough when I got it and that's probably where my passion towards making a car a more original proposition to what I'd actually purchased it at. So it was something that was rough. So for me it was fettling with the car, getting things fixed, you know, crack dashboards, little bits of dents and paint and getting things slowly brought back up so that the car was almost original. Um, that was an amazing car. I know um, rotaries are very different for different people, but uh, it was certainly one that I could only afford at that time, but it was a very powerful car when you're sort of 19 yeah. to be driving around the streets of Sydney in, um, and it was good fun. I did a little bit of track work in it as well, just a bit of club racing, which was nice. Um, sold that, and as I was driving company vehicles at that time, uh, a mate of mine had a rally car. That's a 1600 rally car, and he was quite successful in state rallying in that car. Oh, okay. He'd lent it to a mate of ours around the corner who decided one night that he would park it out the front of the house. So obviously the next morning he wakes up and it's gone. Uh. And we relocated the car and he wanted to rebuild it. And I said, okay, I'll go halves with you. So I went halves with him in that car and we campaigned that in sort of state rally and club, club circuit racing for about two years. So probably the first car I had that I was able to throw around and have a lot of fun in and not really be overly concerned about potential damage. So starting to really learn how to drive a car on a circuit or in many cases for us out in the, out in the bush on dirt tracks in yep. nighttime and start to start moving a car around the track and the circuit and the road and getting a real good feel around where nine tenths were, where ten tenths was. So um, it was all right, so you've got experience with driving rally cars. You, you've been doing that for a while, have you? Yeah, I've done it uh, for a while. I, it, was, it was certainly something in my youth I did a lot of at that time. Um, okay. I think we came out of living in the islands and, and, and were driving on dirt roads over there as a kid as well. So it was, it was good fun. Going back to that RX-4, they're quite sought after now, aren't they, the rotaries? I mean, the RX-7s are, aren't they, the early ones? At the moment, it's probably one of the cars uh, outside my last Porsche, probably one of the cars that i most disappointed that I ever sold, not knowing at that time. Uh, I think, you know, for me, I was, it was a car I was trading under $5,000. And yeah, if you would yeah. try and find one as an original today, uh, when you can find them, they're up in the nearly $60,000 mark here in Yeah, Australia. that's what I was thinking. Japanese cars have gone nuts. Yeah, yeah. Is it something that you would think about getting again? Is it something you think about adding to your collection? I always look. Um, <laughs> if I get to a point where the right one, the right time would be perfect, but I, I just feel at the moment I'd be buying a childhood um, back again and yeah. I just don't know if that's the right car. For me, I think at the moment it's about moving forward. Yeah, I think I agree with you. I, I think I've had that conversation before where people were saying, you know, do you go back? Who was it? Someone on some podcast was talking about it. Maybe it was about Seinfeld, Jerry Seinfeld, how he goes back and buys all the cars from his youth. And it's like, do you want to relive all the cars that you've owned? Because some of them are probably really bad. You know what I mean? You don't really want to own all of them. But 
It might not have been him. It might have been someone else. So, you, you know, you've got this passion for tinkering. You've got this passion for driving, you know, the rally, the Datsun. You know, you, you, know, you had a rotary, which was quite a, you know, unique car in its time. When does the, when does the passion for Porsche start again? When, after seeing that, you know, that 930 Turbo, you know, when does the passion start and you think, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start looking f- for, a, for a Porsche. The company cars are ended and you think, okay, I want a Porsche now. Yeah, the company cars ended and I started the opportunity of releasing my own vehicles, uh, sort of in a more senior management role. So what I found was um, obviously um, family, child, children come about and it changes a lot of what you do in your life, Um, cars particularly. You have to become, in a sense, more practical. Um, Then the financial obligations move to different things like houses and schooling and, and that sort of thing. So having gone through all of that side, I sort of came out of the end of actually both of those things sort of recently separated and my daughter finishing up at uh, at private school. And I had a, at the time, a Mercedes ML um, 350, which was a nice car. It was coming towards the end of its lease. And I thought, right, it's time to get a new car. And in that time, I was fairly active in forums and uh, and clubs, particularly around uh, particular models, so Mercedes Club and before that Audi Club and right. doing a bit of concoursing and things like that with some of the cars. And then I decided what I was going to do was um, the SUV was still a practical obligation for me as far as things that I was doing. I like to go for a surf, I like to do road trips, uh, but I was just bored with the Mercedes. It was yep. a nice car, but it was just too too practical, too big, too cumbersome. So I started looking around at um, thinking what my, were my options, and I had already started talking um, to some of the guys from the Porsche community here in Sydney. I attended a few cars and coffees. I'd been on the Porsche Forum Australia on PFA and had been there and active there for a good 18 months and just felt I think it was time for a Porsche. Um, 911 was certainly in my brain about what I was going to do. That was where the heart was going. But I felt that at the time it probably wasn't going to be the right car for what I needed to do at that time. So I ended up just rolling into a Porsche Sydney South one afternoon on a Saturday and having a look as I do around the showroom and they had just traded a petrol Macan S. It was a couple of years old. It was the launch vehicle. It was very well specced and I think it took me 15 minutes to make a decision. Fantastic. So how long ago was that, Stephen? How many years ago was that? So that would have been that would have been 2016 that I did that. So that was my first Porsche. Well, that makes sense. I mean, you know, a lot of these owner stories, everyone, you know, you buy the, a lot of people have started with the sensible one, you know, whether it be a a, a Tiptronic, if I call that sensible, and then they go into a manual or, you know, they get something that their wife, you know, can drive as well. And they're thinking about their family, whether it be the SUV. I mean, I have no problem with the Macan. I actually, I I like the Macan. I like the shape of it. Um, I always find it's too small in the back seat, but I like the shape of it. Um, how was that experience once you bought that car and you drove it out of the showroom? How was your first Porsche experience? It was amazing. Um, PDK was so different to everything else I'd driven, which, you know, having driven automatic cars for quite some time, uh, even though I felt that um, the the Tiptronic in the Mercedes was reasonable, uh, the, certainly the PDK was just such a different proposition. And what I did like about the the Macan S was it had sports chrono, so it had the you know, sports button. So just that whole difference of being able to set the car up how you'd like to drive it uh, was really important to me. And I think it was one of the things I enjoyed the most uh, about that car. Um, I drove it for <clears throat> probably city driving for most of its life, but I would do a long country trips in it up to Coffs Harbour and places like that to the surfing trips. And the thing I liked about it is you could get in that car, drive it for five or six hours and hop out just as fresh at the other end. It was just such a driver's car. Yeah, and it's, you know, if you want to get into the Porsche brand, you know, and people who are listening to the podcast and they, they can't get a 911 because they need the four seats and they need the room or, you know, they have recreational things they need to do, the Macan's the best option, I think. You know what I mean? I like the size of the Cayenne, but, you know, the Macan is better because of the PDK. Um, you know, I think that that, and the size of the Macan to me is, is the right size. It just feels like it's the right size when you sit in it. 
Um, you know, in Bahrain, the bigger SUVs are much more popular, but there was a lot of Macans there. I used to see them all the time. There was a lot there. Um, they're a very popular model, that's for sure. So you're enjoying the Porsche. You're in the Porsche ecosystem, so to speak. You're starting to enjoy, you know, what it's all about. You're on the community forums as well when you have the Macan. I was. Um, I'd already met quite a few um, of the forum members in, in Sydney. One thing I really liked about the particularly about this forum versus some of the other manufacturer forums I'd been on before was probably the like-minded community nature of the people, always open for advice. There, No one really, in some of the forums I've been in before, say Mercedes, if you talked about doing any modifications to your car or something that was not quite traditional, <clears throat> there was a lot of, uh, probably a lot of haters and you right. would really feel the passion of others come through. Uh, the keyboard warriors, what I found is it was just so many different people. So even down to a fact where I was starting to join some drives with Auto House Hamilton, with um, some of the local guys, which we would do coffee or with you know, small dinners and then we'd go for Sunday drives. Yeah, there was nothing great. wrong with, with the McCann and no. doing the putty road, driving it hard, which I did. And you know, the, no one, no one cared that you, what you were driving. It was about just getting out and enjoying it. Yeah, it's a community. It's still a Porsche. You know, like I said, what the pod, what owner stories is about. Whatever Porsche you own, it's not just about owning a nine eleven. It's it's you know just owning a Porsche. And I'm, I know all of us. You know, all of us have that thing. If we don't have a nine eleven, we want a nine eleven. Uh, most of us do anyway. But you know, I have had. You know, I've spoken to a couple of people uh, on the podcast that actually wanted a Boxster. They didn't want a 911. You know, they just wanted a Boxster or they wanted a, you know, Cayman. You know what I mean? So it, it, it's, it's all about your priorities and your preference and, and, you know, what makes you happy. It's the experience. Um, so you've, you've got this Macan. You're enjoying Porsche. Do you start looking for a 911? Do you think, hey, maybe now I can go into something, you know, a little bit different? Do you ever stop looking? <laughs> <laughs> For me, uh, I, I'd never stopped looking. I was driving the Macan. I was enjoying the Macan. My decisions were floating between what can I add? So that started to think about what was that vehicle like? And I actually started looking at boxes. Okay. And knowing that price points here at a time in sort of 2018, the boxes were a really viable proposition as a, low-cost um, Porsche car. Yeah, absolutely. You, know, you could pick up a, a 986 Boxster S for in the 20s. Yeah, you know, there was some lower, but but something with reasonable miles uh, or kilometres and, and decent service history, we we're, were trading in the 20s, and it was really viable to think about um, what do I get. And part of my challenge was it was street parking. So um, we didn't have the garage space. Right. So I had to think about something that wasn't going to be a garage queen. It was going to live in the elements and it was going to be driven and it was going to be driven to the shops and it, when I'd drive it on Sundays. Yep. So I started looking and looking, talking to people who had them. A number of people I knew had done that. They had picked up a, a cheap Boxster as an, an extra car. <clears throat> but there was just something in it that um, I wanted the car to also be something that I could enjoy in all types of weather and looking at what was going through, it started to become, for me, it was going to have to be an air-cooled car. Okay. I really started to look through the point of saying, whilst the box, it would be fun, uh, a 911 was really where I wanted to go and I didn't want to take too many steps to get there. Okay. I mean, I guess it's hard too when you go on these auto house drives and you see all the uh, the beautiful air cools that always appear on those drives. I mean, I've been on a couple of them and, there's always there's always plenty of things to look at, and the cars and coffees are even worse when you start seeing things. You're always tempted by something. Um, uh, so, what did you start looking for? What 911 did you start? Tell the listeners what you started looking for, Stephen. Yeah, so probably as I said, always looking, but really started the the decision was made late seventeen. And I thought, that's it, okay, I'm going to add to the stable, I'll drive the Macan for work and then I'll, I'll get something for weekends. So I put myself into a budget. Um, it was going to probably be an SC and that was primarily because I thought that was still a reasonably priced air-cooled car at that time. Yep. A couple of variants, so that made it easier. Uh, 964s had already, I'd missed that boat, that had already taken off. 933s were still 
reasonable but ex- reasonably expensive as well. They were still still up there, slightly under nine six fours, but they were still an expensive proposition. The 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 SC. <clears throat> what I liked about the SC was you had a little bit of choice. For yeah. me, we all know that um, you know it goes coupe, target cab as far as price points, and then. Um, obviously imported versus Australian uh, delivered. And, and as you've, I know a number of the, the um, stories have been around the, the passion in Australia for that holy grail of car, which is an uh, original Australian delivered matching numbers type car. There is a real purist view around yeah. a car that is going to potentially increase in value or hold its value. Yeah. And that really became important to me as well as I went through the look was, I, I don't have money to tear up. So it was one of these things where I wasn't there to make money, but it was about getting a vehicle that was probably going to at least hold its value for me and I wasn't going to lose money on it. You know, I've seen that happen on newer cars that I'd owned before. Yeah. So that was part of the journey. Of yeah. I think what you're looking for though is, sorry to interrupt, but I think what you're looking for is, is correct because the SCs a couple of years ago, this is a couple of years ago, right? So the SCs were yeah. still reasonable and Based on other 911 prices, and this is for the listeners, based on other 911 prices in Australia, based on other air cool prices, there was definitely room for that SC price to rise. It was going to go up. I mean, it has gone up. I mean, they're still reasonably okay, but they're not they're not super cheap anymore, that's for sure. No, I think they've certainly benefited from the whole classic car movement in uh, from during COVID and such. And and so what I did, I started looking, I think, uh, around early January, I found a white SC78 Targa on Gumtree, which is one of the sort of more community-type um, channels here, advertising channels. It was a Sydney-based car, so it was easy to access, started communicating with the owner, found that he was living in Asia uh, with work, so it was sort of late night, early morning type communications. It was sitting at his dad's uh, warehouse, so I went over and have a look at it. And I got there. It was a very original uh, car. It had a lot of paperwork on it, but the challenge for me was it was a Sporto. Oh, okay. And I was sitting there tussling with Targa was fine. I actually quite like a Targa. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't a problem. And when I got there, I thought, oh, I'll still go and have a look at it. Even though it's a sport, I'll go and have a look at it Okay. just to see uh, what it was like. And so at this point, I'd never driven an air-cooled car. I knew I wanted one, but I've just, I've never driven one. So I turn up and I wasn't able to drive this car because it was unregistered and they used the trade plates. The guys there had to actually drive the vehicle. So I only got to become a passenger in this car. Right. Poured over the paperwork, well documented, and the price the price was very, very good. For, he really wanted to move this car on. Anyway, I got back and I was doing my research and I, I knew I couldn't do a Sporto um, as my first 911. And I was on the forum. I was chatting with a few of the, the, the well-known um, forum members there that uh, all have opinions but are, but are well-versed in these cars. And it was, okay, what do I do about a gearbox swap? So I was talking about the car, talking about a gearbox swap, and um, James Porsche Platz that you know well um, yes. was giving me some advice as well as a number of the other guys around, yeah, just pull the, pull the, the Sporto out, put it on a pallet somewhere, get a 915 box, put it in, enjoy it. Um, don't throw the Sporto away. Keep it so that you've got your matching numbers at the yep. future for somebody else. And, and James James is a big fan of the 915 box. That's oh, his, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he likes that better <laughs> than, the, than, the other, than the G50. I remember that. Yeah, he does. He does. So, and look, it was the great thing, again, is about that community was there was some really good advice coming and some good thoughts. And, and again, no one pushing a particular way but just giving you things to think through. Okay. So I sort of priced it out and realised, okay, that's sort of getting up there on price. It's starting to get expensive because I don't have access to to workshop or tools, even though I am mechanically minded. I was going to have to pay somebody else to do it. I was going to have to then store this other gearbox without those facilities. So I, it was time. I, I made a decision to let it, to let it go. Okay. Um, the great thing about that car was I also knew of a couple of other people that I suddenly getting all these private messages of, if you let it go, let me know, let it, you know, and James was actually one of those as well. Okay. 
And finally, I, I, I had about three people which I passed the details on to and because they were interstate and I had quite a lot of the history on it, I was able to pass that through. And one of the guys ended up buying it, still still runs it today. See him on on, uh, on Instagram with the family and his young kids in it and it looks like he's really enjoying that car. Did he so, change the gearbox? No, he's driving it as a Sporto. It was his first 911, but he was actually quite happy to have a Sporto. So, I think I have uh, to. I think I have to research uh, Sportomatics more because I really, I'm really not really up on what they, how they are, or if they're any good or not. I know some people say they're okay, and I know I've seen a few cars appear in Australia where it said it was in a Sporto. I think there was a 911T for sale, and it was changed over to a manual from a Sporto. Um, yes, but I don't know. I think actually, I think it was a left-hand drive changed to a right-hand drive and changed from Sporto to manual. So it's like a lot of things going on. I don't know if I feel comfortable in buying a car that's been changed so much, though, personally. Um, so I, I didn't think I would either, but we'll talk about that later. So you missed that one. You missed out on it. Yeah, I dropped that one, and it was. So did you find another? I certainly did. So interesting enough, I was about three weeks later. I was at work on a Friday, and I got this random text from James saying, have you seen the black SC that's just popped up on car sales? I went, no. So I raced over to my desk. I've gone on to car sales. I've had a look, and there was a 1980 black SC, five-speed coupe, red interior, with some lousy photos, really poor description, but a phone number, and it was based in Sydney. Okay. So I was straight on to the guy, had a chat with him, um, organised to go out at five o'clock that after that Friday afternoon to see the car. What I gleaned from him in the phone call was um, Auto House Hamilton had been doing the servicing on the car. It had been in for service only a week or so before. And so as soon as I got off the phone, um, I had offered him, uh, you know, 500 bucks. Can I, part to, can I transfer you $500 to hold the car for me? Right. Because it was well priced, <clears throat> yep. And he said, "No, no, no, no. You're you're not. You're the first off the rank. Just come out at five o'clock, and you know you're the first person." So okay, I went, okay that's trusting. I immediately rang uh, Anthony at Auto House, who I know well, yep. and talked to him about the car. And he was, "Yes, we've been servicing that for fifteen years. Did an engine build five years ago. He's only okay. driven three or four thousand kilometers since then." Well, that's good. And if, if you don't buy it, ring me because I will. I'll <laughs> okay. buy it back in the stock. So that sort of started telling me a couple of good things about the car. So I jump in the McCann, I race out there, and guy who answers the door and he says, oh, yeah, come around to the garage, and he opens the garage door. And, and I, I don't know if you've had the same feeling and, or some of the listeners have, but there's a time where you see a car and you go, yes, I'm going to buy that. If yeah. everything stacks up, that's yeah. the one. And literally that was it. All I could see was the back of this car, black car, whale tail, in very good condition, and um, I thought, yep, yeah, that's it. So okay. we jumped in, he took me down the road, jumped out, swapped over, and then I just took it for a 20-minute run around the, around the suburbs. I don't think I stopped smiling for days after so, that. So that was it? That deal was done? The deal was done. We literally walked back, sat at his kitchen table, he handed me the big folder that he had. It was such a well-documented car. Fantastic. Um, that I just knew and, and I had cash in the pocket for a deposit, left it with him and, and, um, and yeah, deal was done. I, I was then a proud owner of a 1980 SC. Fantastic. Um, so you go and pick up this car, you, you, you send him the money, you go and pick it up. Is it, no, is it, the no? interesting thing was <clears throat> he, he said to me, he said, oh, my son lives over near you. He said, uh, what day would you like the car? And I said, well, how do you want to do the transaction, bank check or transfer at the bank? And he said, uh, "He said, look, why don't I bring it over to you because I'd like to have one last drive. And he lived about 50 minutes from me. Right. So one morning he drove the car over and drove me up to the bank so we could do the transaction at the bank. So it was actually personally delivered. See, that's a really nice thing and that's the stories, you know what I mean? These are the stories about a 911. These are the nice things, you know, the the – the relationship between the previous owner and the new owner, like you're the new owner, he's the old owner, you know, it's, it's all in the history of the car. You know what I mean, Stephen? And, and the fact that he drives it over for one last drive, you know, you know, the car has been looked after, you know, the car means something to him. You know what I mean? He's not just discarding it. Um, and I think that's, what's really nice about Porsche. And it's, and it seems to be stronger in Porsche than in, than any other brand in my mind. Um, so he, he brings a car over, you go for that first uh, spirited drive, that first twisties drive. How was it? 
it was it was good. I I think he he delivered it on the Thursday. On the Sunday, had already organised a, a drive with a couple of mates. So we decided that we would go and do a quick run along the Putty Road, which is a road you would know here in in, in New South Wales. It's yep. up in the in the vineyards in the Hunter Valley. It has a section that's about nearly sixty kilometres of tight, windy road, and it is very cluttered with motorcycles and and cars on weekends and police. But um, we we get out early, and that was my first really spirited drive in 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 the car it was my first ever air cool car that I'd driven um and whilst it, it had you know it was an amazing car it had I think 314,000 kilometers on it when I purchased it right. the engine had been fully rebuilt only and gearbox only 5,000 three or four That's sorry four, five thousand kilometers before so it was tight it was new um, the suspension was pretty gone and the tyres were pretty gone. So it was it was an interesting drive, that first okay. one. So you had but a few it, things to do with it. So you take mm-hmm. it to Order House and you get them to take another look over it. You didn't get a PPI before you bought it off the go, right? You just basically looked no. at it, you wanted it, and that was done because it had the history and, and Order House had known about the known about the car. Yeah, um, it was did buying you have, a known, yeah. Yeah. Did you have to put much money into it when you did that first <clears throat> that first book in at, at Order House to get them to fix a few things? Was it a, was it a big yeah, expense or was it okay? No, look, it was okay because it it had recently been serviced and and the engine again hadn't wasn't that old. I took it down and and Grant, you know, obviously they knew the car well, and I just said to the guys, I said, okay, can you just give me a quick, just do a full fluids, and can you write me the list? go over the car and just give me the list of the things that need to be done. These are the things I think need to be done. Can you just add to it? And it, and the list wasn't that long, which was okay. which was good. As That's you good. said, I didn't do a PPI and everyone, I know there's a lot of discussion around PPI or not to PPI. I, <clears throat> I suppose of the four Porsches I've bought, I've, none of them have had a PPI. Okay. Um, this one only, as you said, it was a known quantity for me. I, you know, I'd had a talk with the people who'd been looking after it for fifteen years, built the engine. There was a lot of trust there in that, and you buy the buyer, um, the seller. Actually, I, I did find he was such a nice guy. He had all the documentation there from this car's history. It had eight owners. It had been Sydney delivered car in yeah. from PCW to Melbourne to Canberra and back to Sydney. So. No, I, I trusted the paperwork. Yeah, I think I'd be the same. I mean, you know I'm a big fan of PPIs, but I think, you know, if there was an air-cooled car and an auto house had been looking after it and they knew of the car and it had good, you know, records, I'd probably toss it up, you know what I mean? And if it was a local car. A local car is a big deal, as you, as you know, the fact that you can go and look at it and it's and it's local. If it's interstate, I'd probably still get a PPI, I think, personally. Um, no, definitely. Um, well... I say that definitely I would over a car I would if it was interstate I'd have someone look at it I, I've done that and looked at a number of cars interstate when I've had the opportunity of being there and certainly your view of uh, what is a good car is very different to to the other person so yeah true true um, so so you're driving that, you're driving mm, the air cooled though you got the Macan still you're still in the Macan that's your that's you your still daily the Macan you still have the Macan for the daily had the had the uh, SC sorted um, the suspension. I ended up getting done by Dave over at East Coast, and I know you've mentioned him a few yes. times on the podcast. He really knows how to set up a car. Um, that was the first one he's done for me, uh, and the feedback I used to get, not just from the drive, but from the people who I was driving with, about how the car handled and how it looked at stance and how it squatted into corners. And and I, you know, I have to say I drive my cars pretty hard. Um, you know, I don't leave much on the table with it, even if we're, you know, we're on um, on country roads. So, it's Stephen, did you upgrade? I do. Sorry, did you upgrade the suspension? Did you actually yeah, change so, the suspension? Well, what I, what we did is I took it to Dave. We went through what kind of driving I was going to do with the car. I'd already booked a track day out at the farm as well, so I said it's going to probably do two or three track days. It's going to do a lot of spirited Sunday drives in very windy road conditions um so dave set it up with you know um changed the camber we we lowered it slightly uh we put some coney um sports suspension dampers in it it had um all new rubbers uh, all new sort of um 
Great. Bushes through it. Uh, we didn't change tie rods, uh, but we put turbo turbo um, links and such in it. So yeah, it was really happy with the way he set the car up. It, it, yeah, I didn't need yeah. to change it. Perfect. I, I think when I eventually get an air cool, whether it be a nine twelve or a nine eleven T or whatever it will be, it'll be one of the two. Um, I think that's the first thing. The tires. You know what I mean? Making making sure the tires are right and getting it set up correctly, like you've done, and also you know upgrading all the suspension and everything else that needs to be done. I think that's like crucial, isn't it, for a car of yep. that age to make yep. sure it's set up properly and it's got the... So you had to update your tyres as well? You said the tyres were... Yeah, the did tyres, did that. So I did... I just did some little fettling on the car over time. I um, I had uh, Pierre over at Atlas. The car had been repainted, so it wasn't originally black with red interior. It was originally a um, mocha... Uh, brown with uh, beige interior. The car okay. had a colour change, a very good colour change in 2000. <laughs> you weren't tempted to go back to Would the original? Uh, look, <laughs> if it hadn't been a mocha brown, I would have been fine with it. Yeah. But, it but as a black car with red, I never thought I'd have one. But it was, yeah, I'd take it to Cars and Coffee. Uh, it was just used to get quite a crowd and, and a lot of commentary on the car. As I said, I did a lot of work to set it up with getting the you know all the whole nose repainted after a long sort of three day drive that we did with uh, PCW, and um, the car was absolutely sorted. And I thought it was time to sell. I was going to say you, you've got it perfect, and I was just about to say you don't have, you don't own this car anymore. So what was the what was the reasoning behind it? Why did you decide that you that you wanted to sell it? You still got the Macan though, right? You still got the Macan. No, Macan's to... yeah. Macan's so in gone. That time, Macan's gone. The the nine eleven's become my daily driver, and I realised that it wasn't practical. Um, my partner has a has a an SUV which we do most of the driving in, but it was just the times when I needed to drive to places. It wasn't practical, so. I started looking, or always looking, but started looking again, thinking, okay, I, I might add something to this stable again. So I'll get another Porsche and I'll add, I'll add to the stable. And I'm thinking, what's going to be the most impractical car that I can think about adding to the stable? Because I really didn't have to think too much these days around moving kids around surfboards and things like that. It was more about being quite selfish and what would I like to do? So I had a few alerts running on some 996s and... Um, I had been watching a couple for a while and, and again, I'd never owned a Cabriolet and it's one of those things where someone said, you always have to have a Cabriolet in your life at some point in time. So I had some alerts running. I really wanted to go down the 996 C4S path. That right. was really where I wanted to be. Yep. And this was, um, when was this? This was probably November last year in okay. 2020. And... I had a number of alerts running and then one of the cars I'd been watching, which was, again, a Sydney-based car, it was a 1998 996.1 manual Cabriolet with 115,000 Ks on it. Right. And on the Saturday morning I'm watching it, I turn around to Joe, my partner, I said, this guy's just dropped this car 10 grand. So I said it's actually become quite a viable proposition as a second car. So she she said, yeah. So I've rung him and he said, yeah, um, I've had it on the market for a while, which I knew, and he said, look, I've just decided we're going to trade it in on Monday. He's picking up a new Cayenne for his, his uh, wife, and he said, so that's the trade-in price. Okay. If someone wants it this weekend, they can have it. So same story, tried to give him $500 to hold the car while I, because I knew that the phone would start ringing off the hook. Um it did. He wouldn't take the money. He said, no, no, you're first up, just come out, but I'm not going to be home until Sunday night. So we drove out to his place on Sunday night, which was a good sort of hour and 15 minutes from our place. And the car was exactly as described, looked at it, drove it, and deal done. So tell the listeners exactly what the car is and, and if it had any options, uh, Stephen, the colour, the transmission. So uh, six-speed manual, um, the car is a um, Arctic Silver Cabriolet. It didn't have a hard top. It had the original 17-inch uh, twist with it but had 18s on it. So I got the, t- the 17s thrown in with the car. As I've said earlier, I am a little bit of a person that will try and bring a car back to its original state if it's worth it and yep. such. 
not a lot of history with the card. Had stamp service, but it hadn't been. It'd been stored literally for the last five or so years, and really hadn't done much in the way of kilometres. So it'd been in Perth for a while, Melbourne, and it had not um, had any dealer service stamps for about five years. But it had only done two thousand kilometres in those five years. Okay. So again, no PPI. It was no IMS done. I was going to say. Let me just interrupt for a second. It's sitting for a long time. Um, the main yep. concern about 996s and 997s sitting for a long time is the IMS issue, um, which people say does impact it. Uh, that wasn't a concern of you, not doing a PPI on this car? No, it wasn't a concern primarily because of the price of the car. Okay. It, you know, it was, it was at, at that stage 10,000 under market of what was being advertised at the time. And I had baked into that that I knew I needed to do some things on the car to, right. to bring it up. It was good, but it was a little bit shabby. So picked it up, drove it home. I actually took it straight down. I couldn't get it into um, Auto House. I actually booked it into um, Porsche Willoughby okay. because I actually wanted – I know the guy's there and, and it was one of those things where I wanted to try and get that big fat dealer stamp back in the book because oh, I'd right. already Makes sense. with this car – I was going to fettle this car back to a good condition and I will move it on at some point shortly because I still have that C4S dream uh, going. Yep. So this was really just for me, it was an opportunity. Um, So I took it down there. They did full fluids and and did the, uh, the belts, gave me the big list of things that needed to be done, which was pretty much anything that was rubber on the car because as it had been sitting for some time, it was 22 years old, it had 18-year-old tyres on it. Wow. So um, they... So, uh, so yeah. Porsche Willoughby goes through it. What were the main things that, that, it, that turned up that were, were issues that you had to do pretty quickly? Um, suspension. I knew the IMS wasn't done, so it, it needed... Uh, the, the shocks were leaking. The uh, the tyres were gone. The... The belt was gone, so they replaced the belt, um, all the filters and such, which I had. So I had all of the filters, oils done and sorted, and uh, I knew at that stage that that was probably going to get me that I could then drive comfortably drive the car yes. and do a couple of runs in it to get a real feel for what else I needed to do. On, okay, on so the, the IMS, the IMS solution, obviously Porsche Willoughby's not going to do that. So you take it to no. house and no. So where I'm at, I am at the moment. So I picked the car up on. I think I had it in on Thursday again, as I tend to do. The, within the next week, I had a putty road run organised with a couple of mates, and I took it for a good hard run and just to get a real feel for the car and, and what I felt it needed. A um, couple of things surprised me is as I started doing some work on the car, I, I, as we were talking earlier, I know a couple of guys who've worked at Porsche over the years and one of them walked up to the car and he said, oh, okay, so this is a launch model. I went, oh, okay, is it? I said, yeah, I could see it was owned by Porsche Melbourne in the front of the book. And he said, yeah, this is one of the first ones. He said, I've probably driven this car. Oh, right. He said, can tell because it's got the electronic headlights, it's got the phone prep, it's, and he started pointing out the extended leather dash it's got all of these um, all of these options on the car. Did so you know you had all these options or that he's actually just- I, I knew I had some of them, but I didn't realise combined what they all started to mean. Right, right. And so he, he got hold of one of his mates at Porsche and they sent me the build sheet and the options list and which is quite extensive on the car, which is which was great. Yeah. Um, so what I've started doing is now rebuilding the history of this car. So I've been able to get quite a lot of history from its time in Perth. So I've started to build up the folder because it literally came without. Oh, anything. fantastic! Yeah. Because I think for anyone in the future is wanting to want to know, uh, you know, about the car. So at the moment, <clears> I've done again. I knew it needed suspension, so I dropped it down to David East Coast. He put Coney Sports through it, all new rubbers. Uh, Top mount started had started squeaking, so I knew they were gone, and um, I've done all of that. So I'm at a point the hydraulics then broke on the roof, okay. and I had prices of up to four thousand dollars to have the hydraulics rebuilt. But that's where I've on this car. I've actually been doing quite a lot of work myself on bits and pieces. So 
I how's see the quality? Up. How's the quality of the roof though? Is the roof in okay condition? Roofs, original roof in really good condition. Oh, that's good. So the the whole is in really good nick. Oh, that's fantastic. Another another question, actually. I want to go back to the suspension just quickly. You said that you'd got it changed over to Coney shocks. Is there a reason why East Coast decided, why you decided or East Coast suggested that you put Coney shocks on it? We looked at Coney's and Bilstein's. Um, for me, it was about a price. I'm, I'm trying to do the right thing by this car and put the right things into it, but I am also mindful of not overcapitalizing on the car, being that it's not one okay. that I'm going to hold for a long time. So he's a bit of a he, – he, in a sense, he likes Coney's. I know if you talk to Grant at Auto House, he's very much a Bilstein shop. And I did a lot of research. I'm a big researcher, did a lot of research. And at that Coney sport level versus the sort of, you know, B6s, B8s, yes. Bilstein, yes. yeah, it's, it's literally which camp do you want to sit in? There, there's not a lot of difference in performance of the, of the two. Yeah, see, for me, I, I always, all the things I've read and all the things I've heard, I always thought Coney's were for air-cooled. You know what I mean? Like a lot of people, obviously mm. all the air-cooled people, you know, the 912s, the 911s, the early ones, the 60s, the 70s, they put Coney's on them, right? It's quite popular, right, the Coney side of it. I never thought about putting Coney's on 996, 997. I always think of, you know, obviously Bilstein, like you said. Um, KW, I guess, if you want to spend that much money. But mm. So how is the, how, so the ride on, so the Coney's are... are they're pretty much the same as the Bilsteins? Yeah, yeah. I, look, I would say yes. I, again, I haven't had Bilstein, so I don't know. But I think you've also – part of the decision was availability. We're in COVID. We've had a lot of um, challenge on on parts here in Australia. I don't know. It's probably general across across the world. And Bilstein uh, normally are ordered for each of the cars. I know Grant will order in Bilsteins whenever you're doing a car with him. And the lead times had blown right out on right. suspension components. And Dave was actually able to get the last set of Coney Sports for that 996 that were available and able to get them off the shelf for me. Okay. So that, that was also another key determinant for me on that side. So the car at the moment, I've rebuilt the um, the roof. You know, that cost me about $460 instead of $4,000. Um, it's working a treat. The car's very, very sorted right now. I've just done full paint correction on it. I had Pierre at Atlas do the bumper because it was a bit knocked around, and I'm really, really happy with how the car's performing and handling. Right. And at the moment, I still haven't done that IMS. So I'm now at you just cracked 120,000 Ks. So I've done 5,000 Ks since well, November. I was going to ask that. How's the clutch? Yeah. Because that's always a question. Clutch is, yeah. Look. I'm rolling the dice at the moment. If I have to do the clutch, which could be needing to be done, I would say in the next 5,000 Ks, yes, I will do clutch, flywheel, uh, oil separator and, and IMS. You know, I've priced it all out. It's, you know, it's a $6,000 um, maintenance bill yes. just for that. That's quite a lot. So it's still a big investment. What about, the, what about the ball scoring side of it? I mean, this is something that I'm not really that versed in, but the ball scoring side of it, I mean, I had someone else on Owner's Stories a while back, Simon, who you know picked up a car and it had actual ball scoring. Is there, I don't know, do people usually do tests on those in Australia? I'm not sure. Is that something that concerns you with the 996? I think you can if you'd like to, but it, no. Yeah, well, I, I'm not concerned about it. I certainly know that there was a lot of problems with some of the Boxster motors. One of the things that is giving me a little bit of soundness around this is everything I'm reading is telling me the early cars, 98 model, um, had the two-row IMS. Uh, failures on those were very early in their life, right. not later. Right. But you were right when you were saying earlier that cars that sit for a while can be prone to problems. Um, and I've certainly experienced it, as I said, anything that was rubber, which is why the, the roof hydraulics went, is that literally they just started leaking because the rubbers had perished and such in the hydraulics. So it has suffered a little bit from that side of it. But now I think, you know, I've spent quite a bit of money on the car. Um, I'm now, I'm probably now at a point where if I was buying one today on the market, I'm probably at that price. But one good thing about it is I know I've got all of these new components through the car and, and, it's, and it's very sound. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I remember seeing one in Auto House, Hamilton, the green one. I don't know whether you saw that one, the green 996 Cabriolet. I mentioned it in a very early podcast, I think when I was in Bahrain, so it might have been over a year ago. And I think it was 42000 they wanted for it. 
Um, and I remember showing it to Steve, sending it to Steve and saying, this is a really good price for this car. It was, I think it was 100-odd thousand kilometres. Um, but I know the Cabriolets, have, they've gone up since then, that's for sure. They're not that price anymore. And that was a very well-sorted one too. It wasn't, yeah. you know, it wasn't in bad condition. Um, so what about the sound of the 996? We always like to talk about exhaust and sound. Have you got the stock exhaust still on it or you, you've got some modification? Yes. Um, I've had everything. So uh, it's got, it had the stock uh, exhaust on it. So everything about the car was completely stock. So one of the first things I decided I might do was I didn't like the the quietness, especially after driving the SC with yeah. the sports exhaust on it. Yeah, um, this was much kinder to the neighbours, but it wasn't <laughs> enjoyable. And particularly, you think about the first weekend I took it out, roof down, you know, back end of summer in in Sydney. Yeah. And it's just such a pleasure to hear the exhaust coming off the off the walls of the canyon around around uh, the Hunter there. Yeah, but it was very weak. So I'd been doing again a lot of research, Gundo or Fista, um, whichever way around they are. So the Gundo hack was the one I decided to go to. Found a guy out in Western Sydney that does them. Um, pulled the pipes, took them out to him, had it done, put them back in. And I just felt that it was too aggressive. Oh, really? It was, yeah. So the, the the first hack that was done was where you just use the inlet and outlet pipe and you literally put a, a, a pipe between the two so you completely eliminate the muffler. Yeah. Um, for a daily driver, which is what this is, and, and around the suburbs and a few spirited drives every couple of weekends, it was just way too loud. It actually sounded like, and sometimes I felt like it sounded like a car had a hole in the exhaust. That really? literally. <clears throat> See, sorry to interrupt again. I always thought the Gundo was a louder, a louder modification than the Fister. I always, I, I always remember reading in the Renlist forums that Gundo was much louder. That's why I went with the Fister, Fister style. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I did the Gundo, and that's where it was. It was too loud. So yeah. I took it back. I took the pipes out again the next weekend. Took them back. To, to Dave, he he then eliminated the Gundo and did the Fister for me, which is the bypassing, you know, I probably used two-thirds of the exhaust and, and such. In the meantime, what I had done is I'd, I'd connected with a guy on the forum that I knew he had a 996 that um, we did a swap drive of each other's cars just to get a feel. He'd had the lowered suspension and the Bilstein's done by Auto House, so it was a bit of a trial and error thing with him. We looked at the exhaust he was like, gosh, yours is so much louder than mine. I thought I had the Gundo when we actually got under the car and had a look. He had the Fister mod. Okay. And I went, okay, that's the sound I'm chasing. So that's what I had done. Uh, and, and that's when I also realised I had a short shifter in the car as well. All right, so fantastic. I knew why it was very tight, direct. Um, and then I drove his and it was uh, his was quite loose and I know it's a common common thing with a 996. And certainly one of the things I did do on, at Easter is I put in new turbo engine mounts myself to the okay. car. And that just made a massive difference to the gear selection as well. Well, you're talking about all the things I want to do, Stephen. I want to put, I want to get my engine mounts updated too. I think I might just get them changed by Auto House and then I, I'm still thinking about the suspension side of it. So I'm, I haven't really come to a decision on what to buy, but I, I am thinking about it when I get back to Sydney to just update well, those things, which is an expensive cost, you know, I know. It is. Well, when you're out, you can always um, have a drive and see. Yeah, it sounds do. good. So how's the sound? So you go in the car now, it must be fantastic because there's nothing yeah, better. The Fista, even in my car, is great, but I can imagine in the Cabriolet it must be fantastic. It is so good. And one thing I'm really enjoying, and we've had some nice weather, and there's, yeah, even though we're in winter here, we've had some nice weather. So this Sunday, it's a big bunch of us, um, a bunch of us, five or six of us heading up to uh, Mount White. We'll do the old Pacific Highway and do that run. I know Steve mentioned he did it. You're making uh, me envious. Couple, You're making me yeah. envious. Yeah, he so did it we're with. Looking um, forward to that. Yeah, that's gonna be great. Yeah, Steve did it with um, Marco in his new uh, Speed Yellow 996 Turbo. His cousin-in-law that just bought that 996 Turbo in Speed Yellow. It's uh, it's a pretty nice looking car, I have to say. I've I've been watching his Instagram, Marco's Instagram. It's uh, it's pretty nice in that it, color. It works well. It's a very nice car. We actually bumped into them the first weekend they did their um, drive down through the national park. Oh, did you? Is we were actually also doing that run, and uh, Marco pulled up. It was myself, couple, probably two Porsches and about five Ferraris. We were doing that run early one morning, and Marco's uh, car, or well, this yellow turbo nine nine six, came through the tunnel with us, and I realised who it was. 
and um, he sort of kept up with us for a little while and then we stopped for, stopped, and then he kept going through, obviously, to meet up with Steve at that time. But uh, it was just to he- then here, I think a week or two later, you guys talking that uh, they had done the National Park run. Yeah, so yeah. It, very yeah. striking car. It's, it's, it, it was good buying. It's a very nice car. Yeah, absolutely. No, he's got a good one there, that's for sure. So let's – let's. we haven't finished yet. The listeners are saying, is that all? And that's not it. Uh, and we're almost – we're getting we're, we're getting into our hour, but we're going to keep yeah. going because it's a good yeah, story. So, the, so, you, so you've had the Macan. Yes, he's gone. Yeah, you've had yeah. the Macan. That's gone. You go into an air-cooled, so you've experienced the, the Porsche SUV, which, you know, everyone should experience. Then you're in a 99 – then you're in the uh, SC – so the air cool's gone. You've got your Cabriolet 996.1, and then you decide to get something else. So tell me how that, yeah. and tell the listeners how that all came about. Okay, so <clears throat> interesting story. I'm sitting, going to Cars and Coffee with my car, enjoying that. I just enjoy that camaraderie of an early morning. And I had a couple of people starting to ping me about was I interested in selling the nine, the the, AC, the SC. And... I'd been toying with it. I'd gone and spoken to my mate at um, Classic Throttle Shop. I'd had a chat with Anthony at Auto House saying, should I put the car up on um, on consignment? And they were giving me prices that I'm thinking, oh, it's not really going to help me get into the next car. And I didn't. And at that time, I thought the next car was going to be a 993. And little do I know until I was listening to a couple of the podcasts with yourself and, and Steve, because I've only recently um, found you, is... Yep. I test drove his old 993. <laughs> oh, did you? So he had it down there late last year. Yeah, and yeah. the beautiful car, really liked it. And, again, did the research, looked at the mods Steve had done. And, look, Steve had done some great mods to that car, exactly what I would do. Yeah, it was drove. a well-looked-after car. I think two people have owned it since Steve sold it originally I think because he sold it to get his GT3, obviously, and I think there was two owners. I met one at a Cars and Coffee, an auto house Cars and Coffee, a few years back. And then I think someone else bought it, and then they resold it again. Nice car, very nice car. Ticked some boxes for me because the next car was going to have to have air conditioning so I could actually start to enjoy the car with my partner Um, because the whole thing around buying Porsches was, oh, we could go on on drives together, but um, it was a bit hard on the air-cooled. She's loving the the Cabriolet. Um, And this was like, okay, well, I'll buy this. And then I decided that the gap was too much between my car and and, and Steve's old car, so I passed on it. And then... I had a guy come up to me in coffee, cars and coffee. He said, you're interested in selling it, you know, and I, I'd been toying with, I said, I threw a price at him and he didn't balk. <laughs> I went, okay. So should have gone higher, Stephen, you should have gone higher. And, um, well, I thought I, I thought I was way up there. And <laughs> so we talked, he did some research. He wanted to do a PPI, which he did do. And um, I was like, just, just ring, just ring Auto House. They'll, they'll tell you all about the car. But you know, he's doing his own research, and he was very thorough and methodical. And the car went through the PPI and, and passed quite well, as I expected. And we sort of settled on a price that I thought I can't walk away from this now. And I had so I had the nine nine six as my daily. So I was already starting to experience new Porsches. Yes. Um, the whole idea was my partner said to me. She just looked at me. And said are you sure you want to sell this car and know how much you love it and how much you enjoy driving it? And, and I said, yeah, look, I, I can't afford to have a collection, so I need to be able to experience more cars. Yes. As we said earlier, move forward. So I'd had that car two years. I'd put a bit of money into it. I did very well out of the car. Market had moved quite significantly in the last six or six or nine months. He really wanted it. He was very happy with the car. So we did the deal. And that Friday night I posted a, a, on my Instagram a, a post of, you know, it's gone, goodbye. And interesting enough, I had um, a bunch of people reach out to me and go, I didn't know you were selling because I hadn't advertised the car. It was purely completely off market. Yep. It was just, yep. which a number of cars, as you know, are trading that way at the moment. Yeah. So um, out of that, I had James contact me because he'd originally helped me find the car and he starts inquiring. And I go, oh, so he said, so what did you sell it for? And we're having a chat one night and he said, I said, oh, you know, they've got this price and this. And he goes, have you seen this red SC down on the Mornington Peninsula, this 1979 um, yeah. sunroof? <laughs> you know the one. Yeah. And uh, I go, no, no, I hadn't seen it. He goes, 
what do you reckon? I said, oh, God, look at the price. You know, it was, I think it was 85 grand. Yeah. And I said, gee, the guy, I've sold the car. He hasn't picked it up. I haven't got the money in the bank. The money hasn't cleared. I'm going, I can't waste this guy's time and start ringing him. And then I'm deliberating it over it. And then I'm pinging Steve back on the chat and, uh, sorry, um, James back on the chat, not getting any response. I thought, bugger it. So I start trying to ring the guy in Mornington about the car. Yes. Because it sounded just like my black one when I bought it. It was pretty much the same type of car and yep. no sunroof was interesting to me. And um, couldn't get through. And then James pings me and just goes, I bought it. He bought it, yeah. As we know. So that yep. story, so I'm past. And then um, I have other... He's, he's a funny guy. And, and look, in that time too, you know, that's James's business. And, and I've caught up with him a couple of times and I've been in Melbourne and had a coffee with him just to talk cars and thank him so much for introducing me to my... Yeah, he's, to my James company. is a great guy. James is a great guy. Awesome his experience guy. and his knowledge on cars, you know, I've learned some stuff from him. I mean, he's got the SC thing in my head. I mean, it's still in my head, the SC thing. I never talk about it much on the podcast, but it is actually there as well because um, people think I take too long to make my, yeah. my mind up. But the SC is one of those cars that I've you know, that I'm still considering and still thinking about. Um, and I have to say, if I was looking for one, I'd probably, you know, I would ask James, to, you know, to try and locate one for me because he's got so much so much reach and, and so much knowledge for what's going on in the in the Porsche community and Porsche, you know, cars that are available off the market as well. And the nice thing is he's willing to share. Like he's so good with his, as you say, with his knowledge, but he's not holding back or being guarded. He's, he's willing to share his knowledge, which is, which is yep. awesome. Absolutely. So... Missed that. He he won. I, I I was too slow. I was deliberating over that, and and I wasn't ready. And then I'd had this other person that I'd I'd known through social media and and through uh, the forum in Adelaide um, say, you know, congrats, mate, selling the car. Would you consider a sixty six? And I've just fired straight back at him, absolutely, because a long hood has been a dream for me for some time. Again, financially, I always knew that the Grail Australian delivered matching numbers was never going to be in my in my garage at this point um, because the prices of those have just gone crazy. Yep, I have considered nine one twos a number of times. Um, one of the guys, Paddington Outlaw, who you know, Tom had um, had Magnus's car for a while, and then he bought a Tangerine nine one two out of the US. I yeah. really can that at one stage just before um while i still SC. You know, yeah you know Stephen. i remember when that was for sale i remember seeing it on porsche forums australia when he was selling that 912 and you know you know that would have been a great car to buy that that orange, that tangerine one he had i thought was a really good car obviously the black one he has now looks fantastic from what the images oh, that the i've polo seen on the forums yeah the polo looks beautiful but that orange tangerine one was looked like it was in really good condition for what it was and it wasn't very expensive at the time i remember it was actually quite reasonable um, it was very reasonable and it was in very good condition. It was a great – he sourced a very nice car. Um, but, again, it was a bit like my my first 911 story. It was everything that I know about 912s are they're slow. And I, and yeah. I know that you're you're considering and you're looking and, and, I, and I do watch Ashmael's um, videos at times and it does not suit my driving. I'm not – a 912 would have frustrated me. Okay, so let, let's let's get into that though. So you you the car you found the 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 sixty six is actually a nine twelve, right? It's not a nine eleven. Yeah, so it's a it's a sixty six. It's a nine one two. Um, it was U.S. Californian car. It was imported into Australia in um, in the nineties. Okay, so it's it been here for a while, been in Australia for a while. Been here yeah. for a while for in Australia. Uh, it was in a shed. Um, down in Adelaide. Right. It had been professionally converted by the Adelaide Porsche dealer right. uh, when it just arrived for someone, uh, right down to the smuggler's box had been converted from left to right as well. So it was a full okay. full um, conversion. Uh, it didn't have an engine. And okay. the guy down there had been chasing a 911 for some time and he has quite a story about... Uh, tussling over cars and partners at different times, uh, trying to get uh, support around spending the money on a car, and he found this car and then started a six-year restoration of yep. the car, but probably more in a resto mod 
rather than a restoration of the car. So originally it was um, it was a, a red car. Yeah. Uh, California, he got it. It was in um, undercoat grey. It didn't. Uh, it needed all new suspension. Needed an engine. Needed a gearbox. Uh, needed an interior. He's in the Porsche community and sources a lot of Porsche um, parts, and that's how I knew him. Uh, this guy. So he sent me an article that had been written about the car and published in in a local um, Porsche magazine in Adelaide or Australian magazine. Okay, I knew the car well from from um, inst- uh, from Instagram and just from the community. I'd, I've never seen the car; still haven't seen the car. You haven't seen the car yet. So what's? Hang on, so let me I have just not get this. Seen the car. I'm, I'm a bit confused. So you find this car. The guy's got the car. It's in a bit of a. It's in a bit of a state. It doesn't have an engine. It's in his garage or whatever. No, he's found it. He found it that way. He spent six years rebuilding the car. Yep. He put a. He sourced a two point seven engine, nine one five gearbox. Put that into the car. He spent a lot on the paint and all the interior. The car is absolutely sorted. Okay. So you purchased the, the car. Road. So he decided to let this car go. He's let this car go. You've taken this car off him? Yes. Yeah, so what happened was he had the car on the road for nearly 18 months. Okay. And the head studs went in the mag case 2.7 engine. Okay. And he's now chasing uh, a dream of a GT3 or something similar. And he was looking at the car and saying, do I, I've just spent a lot of time and money putting this car together, finally got on the road. The head studs have gone. It needs to be, needs to be pulled and, and the head studs fixed. And he was toying with upgrading and he just reached out to me and he said, look, would you be interested? This is where it's at. Gave me some quotes around what he'd been quoted to fix the, the motor. Um, I looked at the car and I went, I'm comfortable with that. We we talked about a price. He'd only really pushed it through Instagram to a few people. We got to where I thought I'd let my car go on the Friday, quite sadly. On the Saturday we're talking. On the Sunday morning I thought we'd agreed a deal and then there was silence. He was okay. going off to check the price with his wife. There was silence. And then I pinged him back and I rang him. And he said, oh, look, mate, he said, someone else has come in and they've offered me more. Right. And I said, so do I get an opportunity? He goes, no, look, I'm really sorry. The guy's pushed me really hard and he's here in Adelaide. So I said, okay, it's gone. So I thought I'd lost the, you know, I'd lost the car. Yes. And kicking myself a little bit, so I sat again by Sunday night. And then Monday morning I get a text from him saying, um, can you give me a call? I think I've got some good news for you. So I ring him. Obviously, the other guy had gone then and talked to his wife and um, he had to pull out of the deal. Okay. So the deal was back on, transferred the money across that week, still not having even seen the car, no PPI. I had some reports and I rang the guys at RSR and Mark Poole's team to who had been looking after the car did the usual due diligence that way and, again, knowing the seller, knowing the vehicle, no PPI and just transferred him through the funds. So you had to pay a little bit more for the car then? You had to pay a slightly uh, higher price? Slightly, $1,000 more. And was, got it. the other question I have, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but the, the difference between the SC when you sold it, which is obviously a little bit more popular to the 912, was there a big difference in price from the SC to the 912? Um, was it like 30% less or 30% more? Yeah, or? yeah, probably 30% less. 30% Be, less. Let's, let's know it's got, it's got a pulled head start, so the motors needs to be come out. So what was probably going to frighten a lot of people off was the unknown quantity. And, and I had to do quite a bit of research myself. So, again, banging into the forum, texting people that I know, ringing guys I know that have had these cars. Yes, and starting to say, okay, so this is the quote, what else would I do? And immediately my head's gone into hot rod. Okay. My head's gone into why would I just do a 2.7? I'm talking to people about sourcing a three-litre motor, getting that rebuilt. And then I started going through it and thinking um, there's nothing too much wrong with the engine. What can I do to improve the performance of this motor? 
and keep a 2.7 in a short wheelbase, because so, you know, we know 912 short wheelbase was only produced for two to three years. So I'm thinking that a 2.7 mag case motor is probably the right engine to sort of keep with this car and okay. move forward with that. And that was the advice I was getting from others. All right. So, so just who, just going back, sorry, Stephen, just going back to the condition yeah. of the car. So apart from the engine, apart from, you know, not just apart from the engine, there's a big cost, but apart from the, the engine and, and needing repair, how, the rest of the car is actually okay, right? The, the body, the interior, everything perfect. is livable. There's nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it. It's got a half cage in it. Um, it's got sports classic seats in it. Uh, the interior's been done. Um, suspension's been done, elephant racing suspension oh, through really? it. Okay, so um, it's money yeah, been so spent, yeah. He had, he had done a lot to the car to get it to where it was, and then I think there was just the, the engine problem was and his desire to move it on to, to do yeah. something else was the driver. So, um, All right, so... So you have this car now. This car is in Adelaide, like you told me. It's getting repa- getting fixed in Adelaide. Who is doing the mechanical work on it in Adelaide? Is it a specialist yeah. shop? Is it specialist shop? So I did a I did did a bit of research and interviewed a few people down there. Got some local knowledge, and I looked at a couple of different builds. And originally, I started with what if I go full on and move this to a two point nine to get some Marley pistons, get the um, the um, ITPs and ITBs and just really do this motor up and put in literally a racing engine into this car. You know, okay. it's a car that's under a thousand kilos. It's a very well sorted. Um, doesn't need a lot of horsepower to to really get it to move along for the kind of driving that I do. So went through some quotes and we finally settled on um, taking the engine. So it's. It's um, at a place called Jam Motorsport out at uh, the Bend, uh, which is in Adelaide. It's a sort of premium uh, racing circuit that's out there now. These guys have been doing uh, racing, um, Porsche racing engines for cars and clients for some time. Oh, okay. They've got uh, a um, the, the difference about bringing it back to Sydney versus doing it in Adelaide. I think you get better bang for your buck as far as cost per hour. Um, there's quite a lot of hours of work in these engines. So there's quite a price differential between getting one done here and getting one done in Adelaide. And what I did like about Adelaide is, and I know you've talked about it a couple of times on on the podcast, is they've had some very special cars down there. Um, It seems to have been a real breeding ground of um, some very high-end vehicles over the years. And from that, they've built up quite a strong capability of of the engineering shops and, and specialty shops to support these cars. So that was my decision to do that. We're, so it's getting 2.8 um, uh, bore out S cams. Um, we're doing uh, taking CIS off and getting fuel injection through ITB PMOs. Um, I think it's getting a, a Motec uh, engine management system in it. Um, so how long, with, Stephen, has the car think- been with? with the specialist in Adelaide now? How, how many months have you had it down there since you purchased yeah. the car? You purchased the car this year? Yes, yeah, so I, I bought the car in um, April. Okay. Ma- I'm sorry, March. Uh, the owner at the time, again, delivered the car out to the engine builder for me. So um, I had it all sorted out. He had it stored in his shed for me. And then he drove it out and delivered it to them. Uh, I've been talking with the engine builder. I'm looking to fly down to Adelaide in a couple of weeks to see the car for the first time. I'm just waiting for them. They've got the engine apart, goes off to the machine shop next week. The parts are in. We're talking probably the car not being ready till end of June, maybe early July. Okay, so uh, not that far I'm, away. I'm not so in by any the, great rush. Yeah, by the spring you'll have it in Australia. You'll have it ready for the good driving weather. Um, what is the situation with this extra power? What was done, just to touch on it quickly, what was done with the brakes and the stopping power then? If you're putting, I mean, obviously the suspension is sorted. What about the braking side of it? Yeah, it's got 911S brakes on it so they were already sorted and done so, so then the, the wheels back, are obviously bigger wheels no it's actually got um it's got the six inch 
fifteen. Oh, okay. Steel. Nine eleven S. I'm oh, not sorry. Nine eleven S breaks from, 9/11, the, period, 9/11 from 9/11 the period. S breaks. From the period. Sorry, yeah, from sorry. the period. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. That's great. Yeah. Wow. This is going to be. This is going to be a great one. Um, there's, you know, it's I, running on steelies, which I think look quite, quite good. Yeah, um, the best. About getting some fooks, but I, I just think this, it just looks so good with the steelies on it. Absolutely. I've been, Picked up a spare one, uh, found one on uh, Facebook here in Sydney. One guy had a, a 66 steel rim, which didn't have a spare tyre, so now I've been able to pick up a spare. So I've started collecting parts for this already. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I'm just so excited to <laughs> that try sounds and great. Get, yeah, get I mean, to get the car. Yeah, it's going to be great with that extra power. It's going to, it's going to fly because of the weight of the 912. Um, so the power of it is going to be, it's going to be more powerful than the 911S of the period? I believe so. That's where we are because the 911S of the period was what 2.4. Yeah, 2.4, wasn't it? Uh, I was just trying to think 2. actually. 2.2, 2.4. Yeah, so the 60, 68, 69 was probably yeah, yeah 2.4. So more power than the uh, 911S. More power lighter. Obviously, it's got mechanical windows, no sunroof. Um, quite a bit of weight's been stripped out of it of the car. Uh, it's got the cage. I'll put it on historic rego, so I don't have to do too much work around the engineering and and certification um so it's going to be a very exciting little car yeah no it's going to be fantastic you've got you're going to have a great car there and i was a little bit you know you sent me the message on instagram and then i got a message from james i think last about the same time last week um and he sent me a message and he sent me that car that was for sale on porsche forums australia the orange one that was the 912 that's been changed over that's been done up did you see that um, yes, I did. Sven's the one that car, was, yes. yeah, the one that was on. Uh, I watched the video because I found the link, or James sent me the link of um, what's that guy? Uh, Home by Jeff, Jeff driving it. Jeff, yeah, 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 yeah. And I thought, you know, I thought, man, that's a great idea. That's you know, and the fact that it's all sorted and it's ready to go, and the price seemed really reasonable to me. I mean, it was ninety nine thousand Australian dollars, but I know people are laughing when I say that. But I, I thought it was quite reasonable considering the work that was done. And you know that nine twelve hot rod thing is kind of it's kind of interesting. You know what I mean? It's kind of interesting to get a bit more power to make it a little bit more you know than what it is. Um, oh, absolutely. And that um, and that car didn't start at ninety nine. Um, there's a there's a new car coming, so it was the price was dropped to clear it out, and oh, I think it? it sold within ten minutes of the price being dropped. Oh, it sold already. Yeah, I sold it, and it's actually going back to Adelaide. So the oh really? Yeah, people in Adelaide. I tell you, I mean Simon, that was on the previous owner stories. I don't know if you know Simon because he's on Porsche Forums Australia as well. Yes, yeah. um, and he's a really nice guy, and that's what I was talking to him about. But you know, it makes it's interesting because I saw a nine twelve, and I'm not sure if you sent it to me, Stephen. Maybe you didn't send it to me. Maybe someone else did. Um, I get confused sometimes. But there's a nine twelve in um, Western Australia that someone sold sent me, and it's a Targa that's for sale at the moment, a red one. And it's only fifty five thousand. Fifty five thousand Aussie. It's there was three. There was three nine one twelves. Three nine twelves up four weeks ago. There's one now. So yep. they've actually been moving slowly, moving through. And the other two were actually more expensive, and they were coupes. Yeah, well, I think the red one, this red Targa. I, I'd seen it, and I just overlooked it because it was a Targa. I don't know why I just overlooked it. And it was, I think, it was sixty five when it started, and now it's hit uh, fifty five. Yeah, it could be gone That's already. Could be gone now. already. It looks. It's still. I think it's still listed. But you're right. There. Um, I, I think they're still all starting to move. There's a, a big movement right now about lightweight cars. Uh, the nine one two is known as you know an under a thousand kilo car. You start upping the horsepower. You don't have to put a lot of horses in that to get a car that's going to move well. Exactly. Uh, <clears throat> what I love about this particular one is is as I said, I've always wanted a long a long hood. Yes. It's been a dream. It's a narrow body. You know, being a 66, it's such an early car. Uh, there's still things I can do to this car to, to sort of make it mine. I really like, I've sent Ashmael a, a note. I love he's finally got the meatball on the side of the of the green 912. It's not straight, um, though, Ashmael. It's not straight. <laughs> <laughs> You won't know. It'll get. It'll get. You'll never see it. No, don't. Um, don't talk about Ashmal. <laughs> yesterday, he said something in his video that he's thinking about. He might have to sell his nine twelve, and I said, "No, you're not. You can't sell it." 
Um, so we'll see what happens with no, that. No. Um, his circumstances have changed. But, um, but certainly, yeah, I, I think for me, I, I'm sort of looking towards Tarmac Rally sort of style car with this. So it, it'll, it'll get some extra bits and pieces uh, once I get it back to Sydney and start getting, start driving it. Well, it's a great, it's a great two car collection. You know, I, you know, it's a, it's a different two car collection than other people have had. And I really like it. It's a 996 Cabriolet and, and then the 912, you know, I'm a fan of the 912. Um, 66 is a really good year in the 912 too, apparently, isn't it? It's one of the, one of the pick of the years. Is it a five dial or a three dial still? It's a five. It was, uh, it's still five, but green. Ah, okay. It's weird though, so isn't it? Some the of green the dials. Yeah. Some of the 66s, Stephen, um, I see advertised some early ones that are in Europe. They still have three dial for 66. I don't know when they actually changed that over from three to five. I thought it was only 65s had three dial, but some of the 66s have three dial as well. And look, it could be too about build versus comply. Um, I know I do PC people advertise cars as the day they actually were complied rather than the day of the build. Oh, so right. they may have 65s that would just happen to arrive in 66. All right. That's great. Look, we're, we're gone a bit over and, I, you know, I like to keep this to an hour, but we're going a little bit longer today, but that's fine because I knew we would because you've got a few cars to chat about. Um, and you touched on it earlier, but I always like to finish the podcast, Stephen, with, um, with favorite drives. And you kind of have touched on a little bit, but let's just, just get back into it. If you've got a 911, you live in Australia or you're coming to Australia and you want to go on a great road, uh, you did mention the Putty Road. Is that the pick or is there another one that you would suggest to, to the listeners to, to try out? Probably I've three three favourite roads, and it all depends on how much time you've got. If we don't have a lot of time on a Sunday morning, we need to get back by ten to families. We're, we're normally out the door early. We we leave at six fifteen a.m. and it'll be this weekend. It'll be Galston Gorge uh, up through the old Civic Highway through Brooklyn to Mount White for breakfast. If we've got time to get back just before midday, we actually go out through Wollombi, which is part of the Lower Hunter. There's a very nice stretch of road that's 100 kilometres an hour along the top that goes for about 30 k's. Okay. So Wollombi is sort of uh, Pete's Ridge that runs out through that time. Again, get out early before the motorcycles. Um, yep. It's the start of the putty going through from north to south. Putty Road is just is just a gem. It is such a lovely piece of road, but unfortunately, um, it does become heavy with traffic on, on that side. But um, they're probably for me the three picks. I know Steve uh, mentioned that they would. Do, we did Royal National Park. I'm just finding it's just full of push bikes early in the morning, and and that's been one of the challenges where we do tend to share the same sorts of roads as a lot of the long uh, long distance cyclists. And it becomes quite a challenge when you're uh, when you you're mixing it up with with push bike groups of push bike riders. Yeah, I agree. The last time I went on the Royal National Park, um, just before I left in 2019, um, it was like that. It was too many cyclists. You know, there was a lot of traffic. It was just it was a bit. It was not very enjoyable actually. It just didn't work. Um, I do like the other side of that Royal National Park, though, when you go and I mentioned it before. You know, we will stop at the Scarborough Hotel there and have breakfast, mm -hmm. and then. You know, when you go back in towards up, is it up through Kangaroo Valley and then up into Barrel and go back around that way? When you're going yeah, back up the, I don't know what that's called. Is that Kangaroo Valley? And then you go up the hill, up the mountains, and it, that's a really not nice. Not as deep, not as deep as Kangaroo Valley, but yes, yes, yeah, certainly you cut through up the back of Robertson. Um, yeah, that's the, right, Robertson. Up yeah, Macquarie Pass and uh, and up through it's that's a nice stretch of road as well. Yeah, I find that end bit sometimes better than coming down into the Royal National Park. Like you said, there's just too many cyclists. But Putty Road, I mean, anyone that's listening in Australia that has you know, if you want to do a good good road, Putty Road was great, and we I did it during the week, and during the week it was it was pretty empty. It was pretty good. Yeah, I've, my last few runs, Putty have been middle, uh, have been during the week, and then certainly if you can do a, a weekday drive. There's a beautiful run that we do out through Lithgow to Oberon. And oh, it's yes, some yes, yes. Very magical roads out there that are completely empty midweek. It's, oh, right. it's a long day drive all the way down to Barrel, but it's beautiful. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to when I'm back in, in Sydney, uh, Stephen, and hopefully I'll get to see your, uh, see your 912 and your 996. Um, well, and hopefully, hopefully catch we up have, for you'll be able to have a drive with the 912 and yeah, and maybe do one of those runs. Yeah, we can hopefully do a drive and get uh, get a few people together. It'd be fantastic. Um, once again, thanks for that review on the podcast. It made me laugh uh, on Apple Podcasts. <laughs> that was a good one. Thank you for that. I have mentioned it before. <laughs> uh, Stephen is tips 911 if people remember that review. Um, 
All right. I think we're, we're at the end. We should, uh, we should call it a day because we're almost at an hour and a half and it's gone a little bit longer, but that's cool. Um, anything else you want to share with the listeners before we go, Stephen? No, not at all. Uh, I think the greatest thing is that it doesn't matter which Porsche you're driving. I, I found uh, the few different ones I've had and continued and will have. It's just every car's a different drive. They're all enjoyable. Um, and I just thank you very much, Michael, for, for giving me the time to have a chat. It's, you, know, you don't really think you have a lot to talk about, but yeah, we've gone longer than I thought. No, it's been great. It's been a great chat. Thanks, Stephen. I really appreciate you coming on. And I know it's evening there in Australia and it's Friday night and there's probably other things you <laughs> you would prefer to be doing. But, you know, talking about Porsches is our passion. So that's what it's all about. But thank you so much for coming on the podcast. No, thanks for having me. All right, everyone. Uh, that's it for today. That was Stephen coming in from um, Sydney in Australia with his uh, 996.1 Cabriolet. His Hot Rod 9919, sorry, I can't speak now, 1966 912 that's being built in Adelaide, which um, maybe we'll get Stephen back on again to tell us how great that car is in a future episode. Oh, and one thing I forgot to say, um, make sure you go and follow Stephen on um, Instagram. It's at 66 underscore 912 underscore 6. That's at 66 underscore 912 912, it should be underscore 6. I'll put it in the description of this podcast. Make sure you go and follow Stephen, tell him your hurdy story on owner's stories. Uh, And that's about it for today. Thanks for listening and bye for now. (laughs) 